So 1895, he comes out with this very interesting vertical, like internal box magazine. And then put cartridges like 30 Army, which was 30, 40 Craig, mm -hmm. even 30 out six, and then a couple of really uh, outstanding lever gun cartridges, including 405 Winchester, which for a very, very long time was the most powerful lever gun cartridge on the planet. What is up, everybody? Jim to my right, Mr. Ryan Muckenhern across from us. Gentlemen, a uh, couple facts here. Uh, we live in America. Uh, we're, we're Americans, as far as I know. And uh, there was one firearm that I think possibly more than all the others, or I'd say a, a classification of firearm, that represents America maybe more than all, all the others. And that is the lever action. Correct. The lever action, Ryan. If mm, we're you just uh, made it un-American. Well, yeah. Why would where would you say that? That's that's some UK stuff right there. Yeah, they would say lever. We say lever action around here, around these parts. Uh, we have a few on the table. There's definitely more than what we have here. But uh, man, Ryan, these are uh, distinctly American, Americana. They represent the American West. We used them in you know in in war. I mean, these are. Uh, in some ways, they're kind of the, uh, I mean, are these the original repeater? No. No. What would be considered the original repeater then? Um, it depends on how you want to define repeating. Capable of being fired more than once? Then in that case, it probably goes way back further than that. Yeah. Like rapid succession like this, though? I mean, as fast as you could, like, index a hammer. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I went down a wrong, a wrong path there. How Get about, me back how, on track, how, guys. How about, how about this? I like your intros, Mark. I, I, yeah. Hey, you got us going. Hey, you just sometimes you got to push the stone. It's all about what gets the people going. Yeah. Hey, we've already pissed off plenty of people with the Scout Rifle podcast that we did. Which so I thought why not was start really off, good. Why, it, I like that podcast almost more than, I mean, 95% of our other ones. But I, I bought a flipping gun because of that. You did. Golly, you did. I that, never do that. Rarely in all of our hundreds of episodes. Uh, wait, post-podcast you bought? In hand. Parts. He's got it. His modern Scout Rifle. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You were emailing about that. Needs a that. little bit of work yet to become the modern scout rifle. I feel like we provided enough like clarification and context that we weren't that a lot of what we weren't were talking about wasn't like you know a clone or the well, quintessential, and yet people are very upset or some not not a lot of people really liked it. a lot of great comments out there. I loved a lot of those comments. Oh, tons! But w here's one the of my uh, one of my favorites, the guy was like, uh, he he's like, oh, maybe I'll he had a Savage ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is kind of we could talk about those today. Curiously yeah. absent from this table, right? But here's here's the thing, though: we're equal opportunity enthusiasts. You know, we like a little bit of everything. But there are some people. Anytime you go into a certain classification of firearms, and we're probably about to today with lever actions, but we did with scout rifles. There is a core group of people who have dedicated their entire lives, and based on the demographic of the scout rifle community, I would say that's a very long time. Uh, anyway their entire lives to that given thing only. And therefore, especially if you go down some different rabbit trails like we did, they may they may dislike it. I th yeah. Well, I think you just have to separate the two things because I appreciate history and I appreciate, you know, authentic, pure things. And I feel like we just, in that one, we talked a little bit about both of those things. Sure, sure. Uh, but today we're talking about lever actions and these things are just downright cool. Ryan, give us a little uh, a little rundown, a little a little history on these these bad boys. So, if you're unfamiliar with a lever action rifle, um let me describe to you its actions, if you will. How um, it operates. How it operates. So, generally speaking, I'm gonna, I'm going to hold up here. This is a, a Winchester pattern. It's technically a model 64, which is actually just a 94 that's in an interesting configuration um which we can get into later, but um, so almost exclusively, they are exposed hammered. So the, mm -hmm. the hammer comes back here. Um, and then they have a lever underneath the receiver and behind the trigger guard that is pushed forward and pulled back that will cycle the action, of which there are a couple of different designs, um, that will eject a cartridge on the forward stroke, pull one out onto the lifter, and then load it 
on the backstroke uh, or the closure, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then the gun remains in the cocked position. Most of them feed from an attached magazine tube. And I say most, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. And many of them load from a side gate on it. Um, but if I'm sure everybody who's listening to this knows what a lever action gun is, right? Um, if you've ever watched any kind of Western, even the really bad ones, um, a lever gun is going to be pictured in it, right? Ubiquitous firearm, um, iconic gun of the West, whether it was or wasn't. Um, it is, it is forever immortalized as such. Um, history dates back to probably the 1840s uh, when we were getting out of single shot, think musket, um, things like this, and, and trying to get into this industrialized era of modern firearms. 18, late 1840s, a, a, a patent is drawn up for a lever gun, and a couple of failed starts um, leads us into a gun called the Volcanic. Mm -hmm. which is a really, really neat gun. And it looks really modern when you look at it, whether it's the carbine or the pistol. Um, it, it looks exactly like every lever action ever depicted in cartoon or television or in my hands now. Um, and that was like the mid-1850s. And it kind of took off, but kind of didn't, and then move into the 1860s, and we have the 1860 Henry followed by the 1866 Winchester, which were really what I think are the hard starts of the modern lever gun. Yep. Um, and in which they maintain much of the, the form and, and shape that we see before us today with this Winchester here. Um, some subtle differences like the 1860 and 66 um, were usually made out of brass. They did make them out of iron. So instead of this is aluminum, um, they were brass. Uh, you might have heard them called yellow boys before. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, Golden boys. Yep, things like that. Uh, they were a very flashy gun, uh, but that was, uh, that was a really interesting time as a, as a species when we started looking at, like, what could or how could we manufacture firearms. At our disposal was iron, like we were working iron there, and we were making steel then, but brass could, could be poured and cast into these various shapes and, and machined easily, or maybe not machined wouldn't be the word to use. Well, perhaps it would have been, um, but could be worked with really easily. And you could, you could produce one of these arms fairly simply. Um, and that's where that came out. Um, that maintained for a while until about 1873. Um, there's, there's a few others that had come and gone in that time frame, but Winchester really released their repeater, the 1873 model, um, which was then another quantum leap here. Uh, we got into stronger cartridges. We, we developed a companion gun now. Um, we had the 1873 Colt uh, wheel gun. Um, we had the 1873 Winchester repeating rifle. Um, and and now, now we're really kind of in the modern form, almost completely exactly like we are today with that gun. Um, it wasn't until sometime later, at least in the smaller framed guns, where we got like the Winchester 1892 and then the 1894, which is, this is a good depiction of. Um, so very storied and long history. This yeah. is a really old system that's still very popular today. Uh, and I think actually growing in popularity again for a number of reasons that are pretty interesting. Mark and I were talking about this, how lever guns are, are hot again. Damn. Right. Yeah. Nothing, nothing is new. Um, they're just, they're just being readopted as this really cool thing to have. And they're practical. They're they're useful rifle. It's not like they give a lot up. Um, well, Jim, you were talking about the Scout Rifle podcast that we did, and a lot, I was thinking about that earlier today as well. But in relation to what's nice about a lever gun, mm -hmm. oh, it's lightweight, it's handy, it's short, it's fast, it's doing a lot of things that a person would want it to do yeah fits easily in a scabbard you know flat-sided receiver mm -hmm. yeah you um, don't have a, a bolt hanging off the side that you gotta worry about and granted you do have an exposed hammer uh that could get potentially snagged on something but i mean it's not as snaggy i feel as a as a big bolt knob hanging off the side i never appreciated the slab side receiver until i carried this gun in wyoming for like six days when i was hunting pronghorn and grabbing the gun just over the ejection port like this and holding it in your hand, it, it's like it was made f for the American hand. It's a really nice yeah. balance point. Oh, gosh. It was, I was sitting there, one of the guys that I hunt with, he's a lever gun guy and, and classic firearms guy, and 
we were talking about the gun because it's a neat gun and and um we're walking and i'm like man is this thing nice to carry like i get it i i absolutely get it now every time i pick one up i'm you just like you just want to go somewhere with it yep. like let's go you yeah. do i really like the fact that with so many things especially industrial items like firearms and even cars for a while i like when there was a point in history where the model was simply designated by the year. Yeah. Yes. 1873. Yep. You don't have to... The 1873 what? You know, the Winchester what? Yeah. It wasn't that. It was just, this is what Winchester is offering for the year of 1873. You know what I mean? And then, you know, you know I, I look back and sometimes people are like, oh yeah, 32 Ford. It's like, you don't really right. have to say anything else. Yep. That's it. Yep. But I also like, you can still get... The like the designation has carried forward too. Like you right. could, you'd still get you can get a brand new twenty twenty three model eighteen seventy three. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you can also get like the Hog Smasher three thousand two, which is I th- I kind of think sad. I like the I'm with you. I like the, no, it's the uh, which there's been a bit, little bit of a buzz on it. That new gosh, now it's escaping me. When you said that it's the uh, it's a Remington. Is it the three hundred buck? Buck hammer. Buck hammer. Buck Hammer? Yeah. 350. Are we just taking now popular... 360 no. Buck Hammer. Is We're what taking I'm saying. 360 Buck Hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Popular man words and just putting them together? Kind of. That's what happened. We'll get to that cartridge I'm, later, I hope. It gets straight to the point? Use I guess. Hammer and Bucks? But no, I'm with you, Jim. I like the fact that the models were pretty easy to deduce what you were getting because it wasn't always necessarily like Model 1, Model 2, Model 3. Sometimes it was a year designation. Yeah. Case in point, the 1873 Winchester, the 1881, the 1886. Do you consider single-shot firearms that operate via a lever underneath the receiver lever guns? Like that would be, the Ruger Number 1 is one of those, right? It has a lever underneath It has the a trigger. lever, but that's to... That's to Drop the block. Right. Falling block. That was something that I remember seeing when I was younger, and I'd be like, oh, look at that gun. That's a lever gun. It has it's a, not. It has a it lever. It has a lever, yeah. but it's not a lever gun. That's so, a falling block. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, speaking of the lever, though, yeah, there's more than one way to skin the cat. Uh, that's, that's what I, and you probably, well, I know you know a lot more about it, but it's like, they're all lever guns, right? Mm-hmm. But... Some of them are what single action. Some of them are double action. Is that what was I reading? Was is there that double Ryan? action lever guns? No, 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 no. That not, wouldn't be a not thing. double. Act, but it was. Um, let me go into my notes here. I brought my notes, Jim. Now I there wanna, it is. Couple, the couple, blanket. Couple things about my notes that I like. I didn't bring them to annoy you, but I I like that they do. Yeah. I think while Mark is searching for whatever it is he's looking for, a couple I'm gonna of find it. couple of models I wish we had on the table because I think they're significant um, would be I, I, I'm going to omit the 92 Winchester because it's so close to a 94 in, in operation and style, but um, the Marlin, like an 1894 and an 1895 solid top lever side eject, um, which dirty secret I think has always been a better gun than the Winchester. No question about it. Whoa. With the side eject? Just the the way the Marlins were laid out from day one, from like 1881 on. Um, just rock solid guns. Um, and, and always were. So that, that one isn't here, and I, I wish we had one. I wish I had one. I'll have one someday. Um, so the, the, what would be the 1894 Marlin and the 1895 Marlin. Um, a Savage Model 99, which yes. was an extraordinary firearm, and so many decades ahead of its time um, and just its operation and, and layout and it just kind of what they were going for there. I think it was just absolutely brilliant. I think an 86 Winchester would be good or a 71. So 1886 was the year designation, abbreviated 86. 71 was like the modernization of that gun. Um, so the Model 71 Winchester um, and... Probably one of the new 22s that, that you were talking about earlier. You have a Yeah, I've got a Henry 22 yeah. that I should have brought in. Yeah, I think that would have been a nice addition, but I don't have some of them. Um, so we're not omitting them because we don't think they're valid. It's just that we don't have them at the moment. The uh, Savage 99, yeah. to me, has a uh, 
so like um okay like you know the winchesters and um you know the henry's like they have that like to me that like quintessential lever action look yeah and the savage 99 has that too but to me it also has like a degree of elegance yes that the others oh don't. yeah yep. yes and when, then i'm very drawn when you see to the it, win- i'm very drawn to it yeah you, you see a winchester and you're like yeah i get it 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 flies under the radar of your conscious mind. And as your eyes scan across, suddenly you catch, you just catch that Savage Model 99, mm-hmm. and you immediately think, oh, mm. hello. Oh, that looks nice. That's different. Let's get some champagne. It's 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 similar but different. A couple other good talkers that'll Can I bring, can I, I found, oh, in yeah. my, and so this is from Wikipedia. I've highlighted some of my Wikipedia notes today. It says the Marlin has a single stage lever action, whilst the Winchester has a double stage lever. So that's where I was going with that. I don't really know what that means. I don't even know what that means. I believe that's above my level of comprehension. A um, couple other notables that should be on there would be like uh, the Winchester 88 and the um, Marlin Levermatic, uh, which was a neat gun. Um, and then allowed shooters to have a couple of non or unconventional lever gun cartridges. Um, we can unpack that a little bit too. Where do, where do you want me to go next, Mark? I want to talk about. We bit off a lot with this one. Yeah, I yeah. want because to talk with about scout rifle. It's a concept, and it hadn't been around that. Like, there's not scout rifles coming out of your nose for the last century and a half. Right. Lever guns. You can't cover it all in one episode. No. But we're just gonna. This is a discussion. What was your What was your uh, What's your uh, Your lever gun instincts tell you, Ryan? I want to talk about <clears throat> the evolution of how they were loaded, and then the ammunition that went with them, where we were in 1860 and where we are in 2023. Please do. I like that. Okay. So turn the tables back. Another gun we should have on the table here is an 1860. Um, really neat gun, loaded from the front. Not a muzzle loader. It had like a false muzzle and a magazine tube that spun out of the way. There's a, a little tab that resides within the magazine tube itself that you pulled up and that compressed a spring. You rotate that rascal over, and you expose your magazine tube, and you load the cartridges in from the top. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. Then you cam it back in place, and you release the little the plunger, puts tension down on those uh, cartridges, and then they feed back into the chamber under spring pressure while you're manipulating the gun. Um, then, f- for whatever reason, either it was reliability or manufacturing costs or practices, or we just learned more things, they became side gate guns, in which we would load the cartridge into the side of the rifle. Oh, come on. I mean, Ryan, it's so much better to do the side gate. Well, I agree, right? You don't have to, like, dismount. I'm just saying I don't think it's one of those for whatever reason things. I think there's a lot of reasons. I hate... It's, it's my, a better mousetrap. In my 22 Henry, tube, I... Tube fed. I dislike the tube fed uh, way that you load it. You have to pull that thing out the front end, similar to, like, what you're talking about. And I grant, obviously, it's modernized. But... It, you're, I always feel funny doing it. I'm like, point the gun away from myself, but also I need to get my hands right in there and then drop the rounds down. It's 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 very uncomfortable and slow. Yeah, spooky. Um, so with with both the 1860 and then with side gate guns, for better part of a century and change, we were limited to like a blunt or a round nose projectile, right? Because those rounds, as they get fed into the gate, are going to go up into this tube here and the um, nose of the bullet is going to be positioned against the primer of the round in front of it. So you right. can imagine what would happen if we had spire point bullets under the duress of recoil. Um, one goes forward, one goes backwards, it slams into each other, and you end up with a hand grenade uh, under the forehand. Well, did you know you had a double barrel rifle? <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, you know, catastrophe. Um, so it wasn't until 1895 when commercially the Winchester. Uh, well, this is actually a Browning patent, John Moses Browning. It was his birthday not that long ago. Was it? Yep. We, we should ate... start celebrating that around. I there. agree. I agree. What indeed. a guy. And also, and I and I want to, if if we can, Ryan, um, it's like Mr. John Moses Browning was a lot of the brains behind these iconic oh. Winchester and and to this day firearms. Yeah, to this day, r- rifle technology has not deviated much from what he. Had drawn up in his shop. Um, so 1895, he comes out with this very interesting vertical, like internal box magazine. And then put cartridges like 30 Army, which was 30, 40 Craig, mm-hmm. even 30 out six, and then a couple of really uh, outstanding lever gun 
cartridges, including 405 Winchester, which for a very, very long time was the most powerful lever gun cartridge on the planet. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Looking at it, you can see why. It's a big, it's a big critter, right? But goofy bullet diameter and, and kind of a weird case. It wasn't until a 444 Marlin came out that that, and the, which wasn't that long ago, that, that throne um, was taken over by a new round. But this is a neat gun. In that, one, it's extremely mechanical. Like when you cycle the lever and you look at how everything's working. Wow. You can see a lot of mechanisms at work. It's got a lever safety. So you see like the lever has this hinge up here. Yeah. This is a lock. Like it can't be disengaged unless the safety is, is moved out of the way. And then it unlocks and this big linkage assembly comes back and this big square bolt comes back. Trigger drops down. Yep. I mean, it, it's it's like wild uh, to think that this was 1895 tech. And then it had a vertical feeding magazine that allowed the shooter to then run spire pointed bullets, like eventually 3040 Craig became or 30 out six uh, had become. And these things were even chambered in like 762 by 54 R um, and, and used in, in military service in Russia. The Russians always, they, they squeak in there. Yep. All the time. Yeah, it's a little, <laughs> little, little Russian addition there. Um, but this was a really cool gun. So this like really, really took lever guns into a very modern era. We maintain the simplicity of the design and the reliability of the design. It's got this big lever on it. You can put a bunch of force onto and eject a shell and, and uh, inclement weather and condition. Uh, but then we were able to shoot, uh, you know, a more powerful, ballistically viable cartridge um, like 3040 Craig or 405 Winchester or um, 30 out six, things like this. Um, and then Savage came out with a 99, which was super neat. That had also an internal magazine, mm-hmm. but had a rotary magazine. So if you're familiar with like a 1022 right. and how the cartridges fit into that box magazine and then how they are unloaded from the magazine during the uh, eject and rechamber process, the 99 didn't have something dissimilar to that. So a rotary magazine, and it could fire cartridges like 250 Savage, 300 Savage, 243, 284 Winchester, 308. All these modern high-stepping cartridges uh, in a lever gun. So you have the speed and, and reliability of a lever gun um, or the, the romantic allure of it, if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, but then you paired it with modern cartridges. Um, these two ran in tandem with the traditional tube-fed lever for a long time. I think the tube-fed lever still like pulled ahead. And maybe it was just a familiarity thing, or it was the cartridge offerings, 3030 Winchester, 32 Winchester Special, 3855. Yeah, well, that is an interesting point. Is it, what was it the, you know... World wasn't ready, man. It didn't seem to be. But like you said, was it the cartridge offerings, and people were just so used to that? Because we all know people can really glob onto a cartridge. Oh, yeah. They've done it forever. I mean, even think of recent times, like we're already past the whole 6.5 crude more really blowing up and being a whatever thing. Now it's mainstream, right? But when it, when it first blew up, yep. people were really globbing onto it. Like they wouldn't buy a gun if it could, they couldn't get it in 6.5 crude. Sure. And now new cartridges come out like, you know, 6.5 whether it be RPM or, you know, you get the uh, whatever. 7 PRC. 7 PRC. And if you can't get it in a certain gun, you won't get the gun. Sure. People do that. And so like, was that the thing? Did they really like what? And some of in my readings... Part of uh, the Savage 99 getting discontinued was production costs. Oh, sure. And, and it's, it sounded like there was a lot going on there. Make. Yeah, which which is a damn shame because Ugh. that gun was so ahead of its time and such a neat gun, and they were generally very good shooters. Uh, and for a lever gun, they had triggers that didn't remind me of a lever gun. Have um, you ever heard anybody say that they didn't like the 99? Uh, yeah. Yeah? I mean, there... I was, I was wondering why now Savage hasn't re, you know... I think it would be thought of re reintroducing it to the market. I'm sure a lot of people would just fall over themselves with this little bit of a resurgence. Yeah, who knows? You'd, it's, Maybe you'd be curious to see if something like that happened. Maybe it, so. It um it, it is a shame because it, it is just a marvelous gun. Um, what it represents and and how it works and and what it does well. Uh, but I think I think one it was unconventional, as was the 1895. I mean it it looks different. Um, and when people would look at this or they'd look at a Winchester pattern rifle or a Marlin pattern rifle, like one was easily identifiable and this thing looked pretty Cadillac. Mm-hmm. Um, despite being, you know, super powerful, super capable, um, available in chamberings that were, you know, far eclipsing the performance of that of whatever other rimmed or round nose cartridge was available at the time. It was just unconventional. And, and maybe part of that is what killed them um, or kept them out of, of the popular eye. 
Uh, and then, of course, production cost to, to put a rotary magazine into a gun and time it and everything has to feed right. Savage on, on some of the uh, earlier model, models had a cartridge counter in there. Get a window on the I side saw of the that. gun. Isn't that amazing? You look at the side of the gun and be like, oh, I got four rounds left. That's so cool. Yeah. And it's like, that, that is, is just... so cool. And it was in brass and engraved in brass. <sighs> and so, like, those little touches, you know, that all adds up to dollars. Nobody makes anything like that anymore. Well, I shouldn't say nobody. People I mean, you do, got, but you just got to spin out the nose for it. Yeah. It's not like something that you would go and buy at just, you know, a regular store. Yeah. Oh, I, like I can it already... Used to be. You'd be, you used to go to the drugstore and be like, yeah, I'll have some, some acetaminophen. I'll have some elixir. Whatever elixir is, I don't even know. I just know it's an old word. And Take, I'll get a I'll get a savage. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and team eggs have a window. They do, but they don't. Yeah, they don't really tell you exactly you. how many. Well, that's true. Have. Yeah. Unless Mr. you're on one Mr. of the lines. Modern, Mr. Plastic over here. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, can I get my <laughs> lever gun with a synthetic camel stock? Um. Anyway, that was a slight mark. I'm sorry. You yeah, ne- you've I never don't said know. that. You know, there. Right. That's my retribution for saying that. I, I haven't seen a. Le- uh, Lever gun with Kuyu Camel on it, so Mark, that's why I hadn't gotten one yet. That could be. I don't, I don't even know why. I don't even know why you guys are attacking right now. It's um, always got to be ready. If we don't do it first, you'll do it, and you'll get us and have us. It's know, not bad, true. Bad <laughs> it's actually true. So yeah, uh, and then things kind of stagnated for a while. We'll go, oh, we're back. They kind of stagnated for a while, <laughs> um, and we were we were. Still using the traditional side gate tube fed gun, um, or you had a leftover Savage Model 99, or you had a leftover um, 1895. And then in 1971, enter the Browning BLR, which is mm. here again, radical departure from yeah, conventional baby. lever. It is, it is not only a magazine fed gun, it's a detachable box magazine fed gun. Um, we can still load it with cartridges. Like 308 Winchester, 243, 708, 65 Creedmoor. Um, and they even had some fun ones in there. Seven millimeter short mag, 300 short mag. All the yep. all the modern era cartridges in this remarkable design. Um, it's like a, it's a geared action. It's fast. It's smooth. You look, though, at how the 1895, yep. right, functions. When you watch it work mm-hmm. and then you watch the BLR work. Mm-hmm. It's very obvious that a lot of inspiration was taken from this 1895, no, in particular. No doubt. No doubt. Um, and I think if John Moses Browning was alive at the time that the, the BLR came to fruition, he would have been proud of it. Um, and it, it, it really is a, a really, really neat gun because of the things that you can do with it. Um, this one's Jim's. This is in 308. It shoots like you would expect a bolt-action 308 Phenomenal. to shoot. Yeah. And it's a takedown. You can take the dang thing apart into two pieces in about five seconds. We're doing it. And it fits in this adorable little attache case if you have one. And, uh, you know, here again. One lever. Boop. Look at that. And it is just, it looks so deluxe and so fantastic and fancy. Um, gosh, those are nice. That's another gun I need. It's a cool I've gun, a, Ryan. I've it's got, a cool gun. I've always been infatuated with the uh with the Browning BLR. I almost got it in seven oh eight and then I remember you told me not to. And for and no I'm good, not mad about it. And for I, no good I reason. I think it was the ammo availability is what, what kept me off of seven oh eight. It's it's a different conversation in some ways, but I was always curious as to why they twisted it one in twelve. Hundred and fifty grain bullets. Yeah. Probably looked at the box mag dimensions and what people would be shooting and I think probably sampled their customer base and said this is probably ideal. Yeah. Yeah. My little I have shot some match uh, bullets out of it, and I really haven't had any issues. But I always thought it was funny. I've always, I think we talked about this at one point when we were chatting about your BLR. But for some reason, I've always wanted one in two forty three, and I can't explain why sure. I would want. It'd be amazing. A, I think it would you be great. But I guess it would just, have just, just for the, no other reason than the fact that it would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, one thing I think is interesting here. Also interesting uh, in my highlights. Uh, let's see. This is uh, uh, lever action design. Lever actions design that lever action designs with strong rotary locking bolts, such as the Browning BLR, with seven locking lugs. Safely use a very high powered. Safely use very high powered cartridges like the 300 Win Meg or the 300 Short Meg, like yep. you brought up. Uh, I looked online though today, and the 300 Short Meg. Uh, you Tragically, in, is discontinued. I think you can get in 300 long mag, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe you can still get the big one. 
or the uh, you, you, the long. When line, I was yeah. looking, you could. All you have to do is look at I mean, it's especially handy when it's a takedown version. You look at the bolt face, and it's it's an AR. Yeah, scaled up. <laughs> yeah. It's so so similar to what you've seen on the end of your bolt carrier group on an AR that it's just it's unbelievable. Right, and I think. Th- from also what I was looking at, like that's actually kind of the same functionality in the Browning BAR, or not not from an auto loading standpoint, but the way that that bolt head interfaces or something like that. Close, yeah, yep. I would say there's a, a larger similarity between the BPR and the BAR. Right. Yeah. Um, Another unfortunate thing that pump rifles are. Well, hopefully they come back too. Well, the BPR. That'd be neat. Meant, well, so, what is the BPR, Ryan? Browning pump rifle. Yeah, which the most fancy pump gun ever made, aside from like the Kriegoff. Is it Semeprio? I I might be pronouncing that wrong. That's a fancy gun, but the the uh, BPR on the American side of things is was it a is. very nice gun. I almost bought a, a four piece collection of BPRs. Really? Yeah. I'm glad I didn't because it was really expensive, but they are cool. Mm. Cool guns. Cool guns. And you have a BPS, right? I do. And those are gone now, right? No, I still think the BPS is still in production. You old bottom feeder. Okay. Yep. That's good. Yep. Eject out the bottom, fed in the bottom. Boy, I'm full of misinformation today. Well, I mean, you might- It happens in right I, from Hey, our... you know what? It. Uh, I am the media. <laughs> Ooh, whoops. So, <laughs> so here we are at this crossroads. And you we're heard back. it here, folks. <laughs> Mark is the media. And we're back. Now you uh, have a face to hate, which Mark really likes. Mark likes having a face to hate. No, yeah. I don't, actually. He's fueled by hatred. We learned that. I learned that the hard way. Mark's hatred? He's fueled by it. I'm not fueled by it. Remember? Me. Spaghetti shootout. That was oh, a joke. that's true. That is true. Circa two weeks ago. Again, a lot of d- digressing here. Where were we? We're, we're back. Um, Again. Looking now, where are we in 2023 with lever guns? Well, you can still get a Winchester 1894. You can mm-hmm. get an 1892. You can get an 1895. You can get um, the 1873. They still make that, which is really cool. Um, get a BLR. For a, a brief period of time there, there was a, a dark time in which the Marlin Firearms Company ceased to exist as we knew it. And guns like the 1894 and 1895 were off the landscape for a bit, but they're back. So now under the new ownership of Ruger Firearms Company, the 336, which was the iconic Marlin lever gun Mm -hmm. in the modern era, has come back to us. A couple years ago, the 1895 came back to us. Um, And you can still get these guns. And they're tube-fed, just like you remember them from the 60s and 70s and today. And... uh, and they're back, and they're still offered in those great cartridges that we love, like 3030 Winchester and uh, 32 Winchester Special. Have you played around with one of the Ruger Marlins? I have. You have? Yep. Are they pretty nice? They are exquisite. So, I don't know if you recall, but about mm, eight, nine years ago, a lot of my stories about guns are from eight, nine years ago, because I went on a tear <laughs> when I turned like between 18 and 21 years old. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, I bought... The Marlin that was produced by a different company for a period of time, 336. I did not like it. There was some rocky roads Yes, that were going down. There yeah. were. I would love to revisit it because I enjoyed the concept Yeah, of the side gate, yes. side ejection. You could put a scope on top, yep. all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I didn't like that one. Uh, so I should caveat this. My experience is limited to I handled two units at a trade show. Mm-hmm. And examine them to the best of my ability while they were tethered to a wall. Um, and looking at the fit, the finish, feeling the mechanisms compared to the mechanisms of Marlins of yore, I would have to say it feels like the best Marlin that has been produced yet. Okay. So I'm very excited about that. Um, and of course, they developed a cult classic and, and following, uh, I should say just a cult following, because of the like interesting configurations that they offered them in. And I think they did a darn good job marketing them like the guide gun short compact things pretty cool yeah um and then off of that uh, this cool aftermarket thing had come out where guys were making them into these custom takedowns um, wild west guns of alaska uh made a gun called the co-pilot based off of the 1895 marlin they made a, a mini co-pilot off the 1894's takedown fit in this cute little case um really really like for like what bush plane storage yep. stuff like that yep 
Mm. Really need I bet guns. It'd be great to like uh, to fish with too. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like if you're fishing on uh, you know rivers with a lot of brown bears. Yep. I think a forty-five seventy in the hand would be a fine gun. Um, or in, if you got an eighteen ninety four or forty four mag in the hand would would be a fine gun too. Um, but they're back and and they're coming around again. Have you seen the Mad Pig Customs ones? Uh, I was I was getting there. Like Mr. Thumb. Yep. Did in the video. So we're not there yet, Jim. He was going on a roll of all the different things people had done with Marlins, and so I was just trying to. Oh, and then, I didn't, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that there was a meeting before the podcast. There wasn't a meeting yeah, before the podcast. There was a meeting. Um, it was brief. It was, it was informal. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you didn't miss that's anything. That's what happens when I'm you know, Hen- Henry, in a building. Um, who makes a lot of very popular like rim fire um, and recently got into bigger center fire lever guns the past few years, has a new gun called the Long Ranger, which is very similar in design to the uh, BLR. In that detachable box magazine, spire point bullets, conventional like high performance center fire cartridges, and and it's like we've been reinvigorated with the gusto of turn of the century firearms technology again, and we've got all these cool options. To Jim's earlier statement, the customization of these Marlins and, and similar guns to Henry as well, um, not not as much Winchester. I haven't seen as much no, Winchester. No, I haven't either. But but Marlin and Henry especially the aftermarket crowd has taken to these things like crazy. And it's taken a turn that I, I'm not going to say that I agree with from an aesthetic <laughs> standpoint. I'm going to say it violates a couple of rules and principles, but they're making tactical lever guns. And at SHOT Show this year, which I didn't go to, but I was watching every day the new releases that were coming out, tactical lever guns were a hot talking point. Yes. And you can get a tactical lever gun now with a detachable magazine that fires 9 millimeter. You can get one that takes AR-15 uppers. It's The time is now for weird stuff coming to life, um, and it is the, the year of the lever. I'll say it's the decade of the lever. Yeah. They're very in vogue. Um, and where this comes from, I can't rightly say. I think that there's a, a, a drop in the soup of kind of, uh, I'm looking for that retro feel mm-hmm. kind of sort of thing. You see a lot of people wearing flannel these days, and- Wearing work yeah. boots and um, that dress. Happened, uh, that happened, speaking of Americana, muscle cars, that happened back in 2005. Sure. Ford came out with a retro Mustang, yep. and then Chevy came out with a retro Camaro, Dodge came out with a retro Challenger. I mean, it just happened just like that. All of a sudden, the, everybody wanted to go flashback. These ones that you're talking about, like the Mad Pig, though, like they're... Like they're retro in a way, but also very a very oh, modern. Those aren't take. Retro, Those are not. Yeah, I mean they're retro in that they're a lever gun and you get them in forty five. Right. Maybe that's not you were talking about. No, maybe that's I, what I was. Maybe like, I for the wrong thing. There. Like what? What? What would draw you from a tactical standpoint to a lever action firearm chambered in forty five seventy? Ryan, they're doing tactical lever gun firearms classes now. I I'm, not at Vortex Edge. I got to be honest. We don't have that. Sorry. <laughs> not yet. <maybe>. Not. <laughs> um. Like what? What about that represents a better tactical solution than anything, um, other than it's cool. Like that. That's about it, right? It is it's, cool. It's a neat thing. They're certainly very powerful. They're certainly very capable. And with cartridges, sure they're like, reliable. Yep. Um, cartridges like forty four Magnum or forty five seventy. You you have some really interesting flexibility from from an ammunition perspective, from extremely low recoil yeah. to extremely powerful. Um, and then they're dead nuts reliable, too. Very, very manual action on them and kind of hard to screw up. Um, and so it's a new thing. And, and it's really interesting to me. There's there's some companies, big names in like the AR aftermarket industry that are producing M-Lock handguards, key mod handguards. Right. Um, yes. Y- you can get telescoping stocks for them. You can get... People are sticking lasers on them, yeah. red dots on them, flashlights yep. on them, just like I had all those things on my scout rifle. And I don't... Uh, people right. hate it. I, Some people hate it. Some people like it. A lot of people liked it, A lot Jim. of people liked it. Well, I, enjoyed, you know, I, think I enjoyed, enjoyed the ones that, that hated it. I would... Yeah. You're I, the one that's fueled by hate. I liked all the positive comments. Maybe it's true. I don't like those guns because I like, you know, a nice wood stock yeah, and a lever like gun. stuff. But I don't hate them because it's nice to see lever guns getting some spotlight. Well, uh, so for me personally, what I found interesting about this, I mean, you could call it a resurgence or this. You oh, know, it's a evo- resurgence. Evo- Definitely the, resurgence. This evolution of, mm-hmm. I'll say, like the modern tactical lever yeah. gun that we're seeing right now. What it's done for me mostly is like 
lit a spark of my interest and desire to have a classic lever gun. Sure. Absolutely. You see yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. you're seeing them in some form or iteration on the landscape being used and it, it increases your uh, perception of their viability. And you're like, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Yep. I agree with that completely. And I think that's important. There's, mm-hmm. there's an element though, like, and we see this at SHOT Show, I've seen in the last few years, like, you know, you're saying a lot of people coming out with these tactical lever guns now and stuff like this. And you got to think, like we mentioned earlier, JMB, he came out with a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. I don't know. And the guy is brilliant. There's no denying that, right? I don't know. And most of the stuff he did, it doesn't seem like it was just mega low hanging fruit. He went in and just designed this stuff, right? Mm-hmm. He did have kind of an open, I mean, a lot of white space, though, oh, yeah. right? Because there was minimal, really cool stuff like he was thinking up. Yep. And I don't know if, have we reached a time, sometimes I feel like we're really stagnant in terms of inventions like like JMB would have come up with. Yep. Right? Because he would, I mean, the things that he came out with, when he came out with it, people were like, I've never seen anything like that oh, before. Oh, yeah. Now, people come out with something and it's like, okay, it's something I'm familiar with and another thing I'm familiar with and they just like put them together. Yeah. I think that's what's so amazing though, is like in some ways you say, well, the guy had a blank canvas, but also he had nothing, not a whole lot to base his designs off saying. of. Yeah, it's fantastic. And but now I feel sometimes an element of less excitement because I'm like, well, all I just see is people recycling other things and just taking certain, you know, and just they're kind of squashing a lot of things together. Yeah. Or coming up with their own version of something that already right. exists. Yeah. Or are you know? we like, you know, scratching our heads like, Ooh, like I mean, this stuff is so good. We've been doing it for a while. Like, how do we? What do we come up? With? We need a new idea. We that. need to like. Ugh. How about no, tactical lever guns? I mean, you know? what's like the, really the only way? I think I've even said this on the podcast before. The only way for somebody to come out with something that's truly going to absolutely make me fill my shorts when it's done is yeah. like, it's got to be a freaking laser gun. You know it's, what I mean? It, it's got it to be yeah. so radical and absolutely yeah. insanity. Yeah. I and hope, you know I that eventually, s- whatever it is that they come out with, if it's if it's good, yeah. It's going to become the new normal, and everyone's going to be like, "Well, really, yeah, ARs are really cool and all, you know." And I get yep. it, but like, you know, this thing's so much better. Yeah. But then people will still want ARs because it's what they were familiar with and yep. all that. And yep. will the AR ever become the lever gun like we know it today, where well, people I think just so. kind of like, "Oh yeah, it's just always been kind of like." Remember back in two thousand eight when everyone started buying ARs like crazy? Yeah. yeah, man, I still got this one that I never shoot anymore. It's like a collector's. I don't know. I th- Jim, I, I got a so. question that'll blow your mind. Sure. Do you think, and we probably won't see it, there will be a day when they're making lever laser guns? We can only hope. <laughs> a, a spent AAA battery ejects. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, no, I, I I think, so it's an interesting thing. I think a lot of it, it comes from um, just kind of the way that people might feel these days. I mean, you, you see a lot of that, right? You see it in the way that people dress. You see people, like there's this woodsman thing going on right now where there's people that didn't yeah. necessarily grow up in the out of doors or finding themselves in the out of doors and they're, they're buying canvas packs and they're buying full grain leather boots that look like they came out of the Red Wing factory. Um, and 90s grunge is back. Yep. Hey, everybody, boy, everybody, who, uh, everybody who you see in the show Seinfeld, you're like, oh, they all look normal. Yep. Right. You don't think, oh, remember when people used to wear that? Yep. Like, no, people wear that now. And so there's, a, they, I think a big part of it is that um, we're just trying to like get back to this uh, nostalgic feeling with things. But uh, like again, I don't want to dismiss the gun because it's still a functional firearm. It's just odd, in it my does, opinion. Like it begs the question. Like I'll use the analogy of like uh, a lot of movies these days. Like they just kind of like remake a movie, oh, but a yeah. little bit different. Yeah. Like is this, how many Spider Man? Is this have? like well, we don't have a new idea, so we're going to remake the sure. original? Yeah, sure. But you can't, like you said, you can't deny... No, you can't. Um, the functionality. The thing that I think is interesting to think about, though, is back when the lever gun came out, mm-hmm. I have some theories. What problem were they trying to solve? You know what I mean? Was it speed? Speed. Was it that a lot of dudes were riding on horses? And I presume that it would be pretty hard to reload a bolt gun when you're riding on a horse. You're 100% correct. It's nice to have your hand in that loop yep. where you can just make a big, giant, gross motor movement yep. and bam, another round's in the chamber. So this would be speculation at best, but I also think at the time that they be, were really coming into their own, we had learned some lessons from the American Civil War. 
and like how fighting groups of people um, went. And so, okay, the need for a repeater for um, extinguishing conflict quickly and effectively obviously came to the, the front of the line, right? Um, and there were not very many repeaters in use during the Civil War. Um, yeah. Most were single shots and a lot of muskets. There were repeaters. I mean, there, there was certainly some lever guns rolling around there and um, things like this, but it wasn't common. Uh, they, these were very expensive at the time uh, of that conflict. So lessons learned from there, from from the, the uh, you know, guys and gals that were developing firearms at the time, and then the people who were leading excursions westward into still uncharted territories, um, where now we're encountering groups of hostiles, whether they were hostile because people were invading their land or whatever reason they were hostile, they were hostile. And in large numbers, how do you mitigate that problem quickly? And it's a repeater. You mentioned the thing on the horse. That is extremely significant. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to load a single shot rifle while on a horse is yeah. tough. So if, you, if you've ever loaded a trapdoor Springfield, it's it's definitely a two-handed operation. We'll call it a two-and-a-half-handed operation. Um, you've got to open it, reach down into your cartridge belt, throw around in there, make sure it's seated in there, close it, cock it, and fire it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas if you had a, an 1873 Winchester, you can just... And a bolt action. I had. I presume, did they have bolt, bolt actions back yeah. then, really prevalent? Um, not prevalent. Once we got into the mid-1890s, then they, they certainly became more so. Yeah. Well, um, that would be annoying on a horse, too, because it's... It's you got to pull your face off the gun. You got to run the bolt. Sure. Well, I guess you don't necessarily have to pull your face off the gun, but I would assume if you're riding along, you might want to just get your face back a little bit to avoid getting a bolt in the eye. Sure. Well, going off of some of the westerns that I've watched, Jim, also the fact that how many westerns have you watched, Mark? I'd say several to many. Sometimes that's interesting. Sometimes on based on sometimes on based on uh, some some conversation and some some demonstration. Prior to the podcast. It's been, a, it's been a while. I don't have an uh, outdoor channel anymore, but sometimes I'll be like, oh, I'll watch a little bit of hunting on Fridays, but then it was like always Westerns lately. So mm-hmm. anyway, where I'm going with, I'm going with the horseback thing, or maybe other times too, but you know, your caulking mechanism is, uh, you know, where your hand goes, Yeah. right? So you're actually able to hold, you're not having to, I guess, reposition your hand to begin... You don't have to bring shooting. Your, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. So like, you could ride one-handed, perhaps, if you needed to shoot off your horse, which I saw in these westerns happen, Jim. And then, boom, drop it down, and then go yep. back to essentially one-handed, not one-handed operation, but you, know. you can control your horse, and you can. That's what I yeah. mean. Yes, thank uh, you, Ryan. Uh, another thing too, like repeater and all the things we talked about, but companion gun thing, like that was a, a big deal. Yep. So yeah. instead of having to wear two cartridge belts. So if you had a, a 73 Colt or if you had something along those lines, a, a modern, for the time, a metallic cartridge revolver, you'd have your, your gun and your belt, and then you'd have a cartridge belt that you'd have extra cartridges on. If you had a, a rifle or a carbine that was chambered in a different thing, you presumably would wear a bandolier or another cartridge belt for it. And it would be a confusing situation. Um, and yeah, a lot make of sure gear, you grab something out of the right belt. Yeah, a lot of gear to manage. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that if I was loading... 4440 or um you know 45 colt into a lever gun that I was increasing its capability tenfold I was certainly increasing its capability and the accuracy potential but it, you also didn't have to think about it like my Well wheel, I would think probably you are getting a little bit more performance sure. out of it once you stuff it in a rifle Yeah I mean I'm not I'm not saying that it's going to turn a 45 colt into a you know 460 yeah. Smith and Wesson but yeah you're getting you know better accuracy potential you're getting a higher capacity you're getting um, you can shoulder it. Yeah, you can shoulder I mean, you it. Shoot it like a rifle. Yeah, and and certainly terminal performance did improve, but it was two guns. They had two different roles. Um, you know, one was up close and personal defense. The other one was potentially hunting or longer range engagements. They took the same cartridge. These things married very well, right? Isn't it funny when you look back and you think, okay, how many rounds was one of those Winchesters holding in the tube? Well, a sixty would have held. 14 in the tube 14 that's actually pretty yeah. nice. that's more than i would have thought even still though say you got 14 Four, rounds thir- there 13 in the tube one in the chamber between 13 and 14 rounds i believe okay so you got all those and you yeah. got your six shooter yeah then you got however many you fit on a belt yeah that's a load whoever up. went out with that is strapped yeah it's back a load then up. right yeah. now you see dudes walking around with chest rigs and they got three mags on the front and you're yeah. like is that enough yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> with a, with with an AR, it's a thirty round mags. You got you know you have one in the gun. You got one hundred and twenty rounds there. Sure. And some people may even argue like, oh, you might want more than that. You might want to have some backups. Sure. Sure. And it's just funny that people went out different rounds they were shooting, and you know all, it was just a different landscape. But it's funny that now. You can go out with ninety rounds on your chest. The, the measuring stick is very different. It is, yeah, isn't it? Um, but it, it it's cool. How did we get on that? We were talking about modern stuff and we went back to cowboy days. We were talking about not... we were talking about what problem they were solving. Oh, with sure, the, uh, there you go. By going with the lever. Yeah, and our well, here's a question: Are we solving a problem today with these modernized accoutrements uh, that you can get for your lever gun? That one, I have a much longer mm. pause after because as I think about it, no, probably not. Uh, but this is what I love about America is we You're have options. You're increasing like its capability, perhaps, though. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, giving you a little modularity, but like, is that is that the the gun of the future? I still don't think so. No. Um, no. I, it's refreshing to see that they're getting some, I think, much-deserved attention, and I'm hoping that I see more lever guns in the woods um, after this. And I think every time we do a podcast, we, we see what listeners are um, chiming in about you know we do a cartridge talk or whatever some newfangled high performance cartridge somebody's just like hey my old 3030 my old 32 special my old 3855 or 375 winchester still kills deer um i'm yep. hoping that more are going to kill deer yeah yeah i think what you're getting at with the modern with the with the tactical lever guns mm-hmm. is that it's funny because everyone who gets a tactical lever gun they try and make it as much like an ar as they can yeah. but in the end it's still not an ar no and so it's like, if you're setting out to do that, because now my personal opinion, when I see those guns, I think they're sick. And I think it'd be fun to have one. Sick I'm as not, in like, uh, like awesome. Cool. Okay. Got I'm it. not willing to spend the money on one, at least not right now, because there's other things that I'm more interested in. However, I definitely wouldn't mind having one because I think it's dope. I, about oh, that, Ryan? You know what dope means, I, right? Yeah, that's what now, that's common now, vernacular. Um, but it's never going to, in my, it, it will never ever be. Like, oh, yeah, I'm, I got this because it's going to replace my AR. Because right. I'm not fooling myself into thinking that it will be better than an AR yeah. for those desired tactical scenarios in a modern-day setting. You know what I mean? It's, so it's, it's an, I'm going to use the word aesthetic. It yeah. is. Okay. It's like, it's a, it's, uh, yeah, okay. that's what it is. It's just cool. It's fun. And which is, like you were just alluding to, you're like, this is a great part of being in America. You can do whatever you want. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. My hope is, is that... The focus shift is toward those guns, yeah. which will free up some of the market space on pre-64 Winchester 94s, Model nope. 64s. No, nope. well. it's going to make it worse. Oh, Mark, please. He said I'm his sorry. Hope. He's hoping. Let my, a guy hope. My hope is is that the shift of focus goes towards um, the ability to hang a Picatinny rail on your free float handguard on your lever gun, which a lot of which are coming threaded now to put a suppressor on, which actually I think is marvelous. Um, Everything should come with... Yeah, threading, and then I'm going to be able to find some some of the you know the older stuff. I want I want more pre safety Winchester or uh, Marlin 336s and pre safety um, 1895s, and I want old pre 64 94s and 64s. I can say from following the car industry, it's not going to happen. I, it's well, going to make it worse. Jim, I hope. Sorry. Okay. I was yelling at Mark before. I know. And then you said the same thing. Shattering your. Yeah. Hopes yeah. and dreams, but then I shattered it too. That's okay. He's still got one up on you. Maybe get my coffee off the table because he thinks it's unsightly. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. You're, now you're trying to paint me as some sort of coffee hater, which I'm not. Three episodes in a row. I just it's thought true. it cluttered the table. We've got these. Mark's not letting Ryan drink his coffee. Beautiful firearms on the table. and a, Right. What's your all time favorite? Oh, I was going to ask the same thing. I was going well, to have... you might not. You, you don't even know what I'm asking. Okay, I well, might. I might say. Don't close it because I've movie. got like one thing. No, not movie. Maybe we can get into that. But what is your all-time favorite cartridge that is commonly known to be shot out of a lever gun? You know what I mean? Because obviously, with a BLR, you could just say like, "Oh yeah, I really like 308." But you know, that's kind of lame. Like, pick one that goes in a tube style magazine or something like that. I mean, I'd love to say 4570. Sure. But they were in a lot of things before they were in a lever gun. Okay, yeah. Well, you just yeah. like the forty-five seventy as your favorite cartridge in general. It's a so good maybe one. everything but forty-five seventy. You know, I have a lot of love for the thirty thirty. Yeah, it is. It is a fantastic little cartridge. Um, it's pretty mild to shoot. It's very easy to reload. Um, it comes in a lot of nice guns, um, and I, 
I, I think it's wonderful. But that's hard for me to pin down because there's a couple lever guns that I really want um, that might not be in 3030. Yeah. So I want an old 1895 in either 3040 Craig or 30 out six. Um, I want it kitted out with a similar peep sight sure. that I have on here now. This is a vintage peep. Um, I wasn't able to date it necessarily, but it's older than my parents. I know that much. Um, and I want to use that for hunting mule deer. I want another 64. Uh, I'd like a deluxe. This is just a standard. I'd like it in either 3030 or 32 Winchester Special. Um, and I really want an early 1900s, like between, you know, I'm going to say 1905 and 1915. I want a 94 rifle, and I want it with either a button magazine or this configuration. It's called a half mag. I want it with a pistol grip and a shotgun buttstock. So basically, this gun yeah. just much older. You're you're bringing up a lot of interesting the uh, what what's the word a category, ca- category configurations configurations yep. of lever guns. Yep. That we haven't really gone into yet. Because yeah. you just, you mentioned you wanted a rifle. Yep. Why, you know, some people would be like, they're all rifles, aren't they? No. Nope. But there's carbines, mm-hmm. right? And then there's pistol grips. And then there's, what is this one called? Straight stock. Straight stock on yep. the BLR. There's all kinds of different, you could you could have the same action, but even but the gun is is categorized differently based on the furniture, the barrel length, the sight system, maybe. And, and that's what got me in love with the Model 64, is because I wanted a very specific 94. Um, it was very hard to find because they were like special orders from Winchester. Uh, they weren't like running catalog models. And so you'd see these, the bill of sale would say like 94 or 1894, model 1894, caliber 30 WCF or 3030 Winchester, same thing, um, or 32 Winchester special or whatever cartridge it was. And then it would say special. And then what defined special? Well, it was all over the place. I mean, pistol grip, shotgun style, butt plate, Half mag, button mag, full mag, full octagon, round, half octagon, half round. Take your pick. I mean, it came yeah. in a lot of different ways. Um, did it have a peep sight from the factory? Did it not? Um, the the 64 was the commercial variant of most of the things that I liked from the 94, quote, specials. Um, and here it is in front of the table. I do love the form factor of it. Yeah. So it is a rifle. It's got a longer barrel. It has a half yeah. mag. It doesn't go all the way to the end of the barrel. Um, it has a pistol grip stock. It is a shotgun style butt plate instead of the crescent style butt plate. Um, I put a peep sight on it, uh, and it, to me, it's 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 like a it's a rifle in every sense of the word. The carbine, shorter barrel, full length tube. They had an even shorter carbine. They called them trappers. Um, that they had these really interesting I short barrels. I love trappers. Yep. So there, there's Those there's are some so cool. There's some factory trappers out there that are SBRs as classified today. And they have these 14 inch barrels, and that's awesome. Yeah, and and super cool thing. Saddle ring carbines. I mean, the, the list of of available variants at the time just goes on and on and on and on. And I think it's really neat. You could kind of have them any way you wanted to, um, which you really can't do anymore. And so those are few and far between and hard to come by. Um, and when you do, it's just like a fleeting moment. It took me. Like 14 months to buy this gun. I found it. It takes you a long time to do anything. No, I to went to fair. I went to go get this gun in Nebraska. I, found I remember it. that. Yeah. yeah. I, I drove to Nebraska to pick this gun up and it was gone. And then I found it months later in Alaska. And it was the same same gun. Gun. Yep. Not the same model. No, same gun. Yeah. Yeah. And it took it it was a it was a goat rope to get it pulled in. You got it. Yeah. Um, so b- backing up to your original question, cause I got a little derailed there. I still think it's a 30, 30 or 32 special at what point. Yeah. So when, when lever guns really kind of came, let's talk, you know, 1800s at this yeah. point, lever guns are pretty popular, yep. obviously, especially 1890s. What was the quintessential lever gun cartridge then? That's f- part one of my question. I would say either a 4440. Right. Or 3240. Okay. 3840. Um, you just named three. Yep, those were those were hot. So, the what I want to know is when I kind of you know obviously I said thirty two forty thirty two twenty. Okay, got it. Great. I'm I'm a I'm a young buck yeah. here, right? So like when I started paying attention to whatever 
so and so's dad or grandpa was using yeah. it as a hunting rifle, or you know, so and so got handed down to them to go out for whitetail hunt or something like that. It was always thirty thirty. Yeah, I thought when lever guns first came out, they came out in thirty thirty. Well, the that was the did. only thing ever. Yeah, the, you know what I mean. Eighteen ninety four did. Well, so at what point in history did the quintessential lever gun cartridge switch over to the from, 3030? To the 3030. Yeah. That's what I'm curious hmm. about. It, it, I don't feel it probably could have happened immediately upon the release of the 3030, unless maybe it just took off like wildfire and people loved the specifications and the attributes of it. But when you have something so deeply ingrained in culture like the lever yeah. gun already was with the cartridges it was already shooting, I would have had to imagine it would have taken a little time. Even the lightning in a bottle prom queen six five Creedmoor took at least you know a couple of years. Two years, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. I think that a lot of that would have to do with when big game hunting really exploded. When when like especially deer hunting um, for whitetails. Yeah, that's right. Because it wasn't always yeah. So a I, massive. Thing. I like I like those old black and whites where you see like the the old hunting party and they've got like the meat pole and they, or they've got an old Ford and they've got like deer draped all over it. Um, you still see a lot of 92 Winchesters in there, um, and probably shooting a 38 or a 44, mm -hmm. uh, if I had to guess. Um, and I, I'd bet into the 1920s, when people started really appreciating the advantages found with, at that time, modern ballistics and modern cartridges, I'd have to imagine that 30-30 became, by and large, the more popular big game hunting round. Right. Um, in that... With the exception of one instance in my life, have I ever met somebody who actually hunted with a 92 in an old chambering? Um, like the, um, you know, 357 and 45 Colts, whole nother story, because you can get those things snoozed up pretty hot. Um, but 2520, which was a horrible choice, <laughs> terrible choice. But God, he loved that rifle and he killed deer with it. Took a lot of the magazine to do it, but he was crazy about it. <laughs> and so, like, I've met hundreds the, of hundreds of people. On the tenth people. shot, it works every time, right? Uh, I've met hundreds of people that use thirty thirty, thirty two special, thirty five Remington, three fifty six Winchester. Um, you know, quintessential lever gun hunting cartridges. Far fewer use the old style stuff. Um, so I, I don't know. I. I'm guessing I'd have to say somewhere around the 1910s to teens to, to twenties, you know, where that became kind of a thing. Um, and then I think it would probably be pretty regional too, because you'd have your, your hunters in, in say Northern Minnesota, Northern Wisconsin, Michigan, um, and then up the Eastern seaboard into Maine that were probably using those guns because it was more conducive for success in the terrain they were hunting out West at that point in time, we had the Model 54 Winchester. The Model 70 had come onto the scene in the late 30s and, and 40s. Um, you had the 700 not long after that. And then everybody was going to telescopic weapon sites and bolt guns were more conducive for mounting a telescopic weapon site. And then, you know, that's where it kind of took over was bolt yeah. guns. Bolt guns are all so much easier to shoot from a rest. Yeah. That's the one thing that... You get in a prone, or you get the rifle rested against a pack, and yeah. you're like, "Oh, this is going to be great." And then you got to load a lever gun. And you're like, oh, oh, "Get up, roll over." Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, that's hard to say. Yeah. You should put some study into that. Um, but I hope I hope that they're going to enjoy this. Remington just announced in, uh, this new cartridge, a 360 buck hammer, which Mark talked about earlier. Straight wall. So think uh, think 357 Remington Magnum, but XXXL. Hmm. Um, straight wall, you know, 357, 358 diameter bullet, um, putting up numbers not dissimilar from the muzzle velocity that you're achieving out of a 3030, um, and a lot of punch. Um, that's going to be dropped in the new Marlin mm -hmm. 336. Well, and, and by its, you know, Henry. nomenclature there, yeah. you know, pretty obvious what it's for. And, yeah. and then also you've got these, uh, you know, states that have integrated these straight walls. Mm -hmm into their deer seasons mm -hmm. as an option, say perhaps like for a person who doesn't want to use a muzzle loader or something sure. like that. Um, it's, in, it's interesting to watch the evolution of these types of cartridges and, you know, maximizing performance in yeah. that straight wall platform. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fairly recent too. I mean, yeah, we've, we've seen a lot of lever guns in the hunting scene, especially specifically those in like, I say 45, uh, 70 or 444 Marlin, um, enjoying success now that the straight wall thing is a thing. Uh, 
So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully that kind of gives it a bit more teeth too. I do feel like they missed out on a potential marketing or at least low key marketing opportunity in calling it the 360 buck hammer. Because we all know the number in the cartridges usually doesn't really mean anything, or at least not the third number oftentimes. Right. And if they would have called it, now this might have given across the wrong impression, but the buck hammer 365. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that would give the wrong impression. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, so, so that particular, you know, it doesn't mean you're not thinking about going out and hammering some bucks three sixty five. You could, you, you could, just, you could know. use it as some sort of litmus test for like seeing the like people who poacher. purchase <laughs> that. Right, <laughs> says right on it what it's for. Yeah. Um, I've got a fun fact. At least it's a trap. It's from uh, it's from my wiki printouts here. So I'm I'm going to uh, grain of salt my uh, factoid here. But Jim, we could actually. Which I think is absolutely amazing and awesome. We get a fair amount of like comments uh, and listeners from Australia, the Aussies, Australia. Yeah. chime in. And actually, so we did that uh, when we were podcasting about uh, recovery gear the other day. I don't know when it's going to come out in relation to this one. So if it hasn't come out, there's a little a little tease. Mm. You were giving those guys all sorts of shout outs. In regards to that, yeah, they just they just know. But uh, this little thing here says Australian firearm laws strictly control pump and semi-automatic actions. Lever operation falls into a more lenient category, hence the recent popularity of lever action in that country. Incredible. I found that quite curious. I, like I like it. So hopefully it stays the same for those guys. That must I know. be uh, that was like a government thing. The government oh, yeah. looked at pump actions and they were like, oh, they were like, oh, dangerous, mate, <laughs> yeah. something like that. And they looked at what was the other one. I don't Here, know. They looked at some other Here, things. And then they looked at lever guns and they were like, I can't do anything dangerous with that. It's like a muzzle loader. Yeah. Um, they thought the tube magazine underneath was the ramrod. No. So hopefully that is the case, stays the case. I know those those uh, fine folks over there deal with some pretty stringent they do. regulations in that they department. Do. They do. Um, also, speaking of lever actions, well, uh, lever action uh, shotguns. Sure. That's a thing. It has been for a long time. Pre- only pretty much in 410, am I correct? No. Are there big well, ones? Well, okay, modern stuff, yeah. Modern ones, yeah, yeah. because I have looked around because I yep. love live reactions so yep. much. Yep. Um, and also in my readings, one thing that I found curious, you know, Mr. Uh, John Moses was developing a shotgun for Winchester, and essentially, <laughs> it w- it, from what I read, he was um, insistent that a pump action was actually the better choice mm-hmm. uh but they still went forward with the lever action the he, i think he still designed it but he was like i think this is a better idea and they're like no we'll do this one jmb himself wanted a pump huh yeah well now i 1887 if you've ever seen the movie terminator arnold schwarzenegger wields an 1887 that's been cut down on the old motorcycles when he's doing that with no kidding yep it's a neat gun very cool very novel yeah yep very cool but I think part I'm not now. This is speculation on my part too, though. I think you, I can see from you know Winchester's standpoint, they're like, we've got all this momentum. Everybody's familiar with it. They yeah. love it. Easy transition, yeah. proven. You know, but no country for old men. That was a Remington eleven hundred or an eleven eighty seven. That wasn't a that wasn't a lever action, was it? I could I thought I remember seeing him do this. All, really, the, the everything about his gun was was completely blurred. When I watch that movie, because I'm so enamored by the suppressor. Oh, it's pretty special. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the 87 was lever action um, 10 gauge. Lever action 10 gauge. Now, there's Ooh. a thing. That'd be something. It's a big, it's a big one. 10 gauge is a very different thing then than it is now. I was going to say, that'd be a hell of a turkey gun. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It's two and seven eighths inch shell. Paper hold. Yeah. What? Yeah. What do you think about hunting with a lever gun versus hunting with a bolt action rifle? Um, like, the, in the, is there really, you know, an advantage, say, to one over the other? I suppose it depends. Um, so I've carried this this uh, 64. I took it to Wyoming, tried to kill a pronghorn with it, missed. Um, I know a lot of times you do this for because it's what you want to do. Yeah. Regardless. Uh, they're fast. There's that. Um, they generally come in less powerful chamberings that don't have what I think a lot of people have deemed um, meritable ballistics 
like ballistical efficient, muzzle velocity. I mean, even with the newfangled like Hornady's Lev Revolution ammo in a thirty thirty, it turns it into a radically different firearm, but it's still miles beneath the three oh eight in performance. Right, but I think you're also seeking a different experience than what some of these more modern cartridges might afford you. Yeah, perhaps. Right. So is there an advantage to it? I suppose it's in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. You know, pretty low recoiling in general. Um, They're they're certainly not as spicy as a 308 would be in a similarly weighted gun. More than adequate for killing deer. Unless you have one in a 308 and a lightweight gun, in which case it's spicy meatball. Um, They are quick. They are handy and, and portable. So there's that. Um, but I think aside from the speed of manipulation and the capacity, no. I'd say everything is probably a disadvantage um, if we're looking at accuracy potential. And they often shoot very good. Like I, I've shot this gun as a parlor trick to 300 yards, and I'm able to hit the big steel plate. Um, I wouldn't push it past two. And realistically, I'd like to keep it around one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're certainly going to afford yourself a bit more um, opportunity for success with a more accurate system like that found in a bolt gun. And then, of course, the ammunition availability and capabilities is generally observed as greater than that in a bolt gun. Yeah. Enter guns like the BLR or the Henry Long Ranger, that kind of goes out the window. Now you're marrying modern ballistics um with the speed of the lever gun and generally appreciating accuracy not dissimilar from that of a bolt gun. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, it's going to be a personal preference thing of that. The nice thing is if you do feel as though you have to limit your range a bit with a gun like this, to Mark's point, especially somebody like you, even I would say in certain cases somebody like myself too, if you're looking for a certain experience, say you do want to keep it within 100 yards, then that might require you to go on a stock yeah. more so on a rifle hunt right. with a gun like this. And it lends itself very well to that because mm-hmm. of its very low drag and it's very svelte, lightweight, handy, all the things that we've already mentioned. Mm-hmm. And so therefore it lends itself to that a little bit better. That would be fun to do. I've always thought after we did the Arizona hunt and we went on those crazy cool stalks with bows, mm-hmm. I was like, well, I would love to go and actually, you know, because I'm not that good with a bow, admittedly. I'd love to go and do something where I could still do a stock, but then have, <laughs> I, w- I want it more in the bag, Mark. I want to be able to then just blast it well, with a gun. <laughs> and so, like, and, and to, <laughs> to your point, Jim, uh, yeah, it's like, except I want the ending to- I want to, all the uh, challenge, except for at the very end, I want to be like, all right, hey, I got you, and then- I mean, that's kind of like how I think about, you know, bow hunting turkeys versus shotgun hunting turkeys. Like, at the end, the hunt is the same, except you got them. Uh, (laughs) And now all the guys that love to bow hunt turkeys, and a lot of guys do it very successfully, and they get them all the time. Don't hate me. Um, Sorry. Because I know know it can be extremely effective. Uh, But, no, I mean, I think it it harkens back to uh, an era that's also just distinctly American. Oh, yeah. And... And just the nostalgia component, um, you know, I'm I'm probably more drawn to it than ever. Now, admittedly, like, I don't like to put my, like, if I was like, if it was like, you know, our our rifle deer season where you can shoot bucks, I'm probably not going to bring, you know, an open-sided lever gun. Right. Now, you can mount a scope on. But also, like, on the flip side... I always tell myself that I'm like, oh, I'm going to go out for the rifle doe season. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, you know. It's not like a, a crazy priority. And But oftentimes if I'm going to go out for the rifle doe season, I'm doing the classic, well, I'm gonna, you know, it's later in the season. I'm going to yep. you know, wait for them to, you know, come out on food. And it's just like, you know, that you know that classic whitetail waiting game. That's like, eh, you know, I, not that I could take it or leave it, but like, you know, I might pick my kids over that. Sure. Um you say, well, let's go find a big block of timber and uh, go still hunt it through the day, mm-hmm. carrying a light, handy lever gun where you're going to shoot something at 50 yards. Yep, that is the way. Now that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, and heck, last time I hunted whitetails with this gun, it was with Jim. And that's what we did. We still hunted. We covered, we probably only covered like 400 yards in couple hours. Yeah, I mean, it took a long time. And I we remember actually, you guys came Which close. gun was I borrowing from you on you that? You had a, a Model 700 of mine, a Not 6. That's right. And it, it was, we... That was before I had this. 
we we both pulled up on deer multiple times, but it was like in the timber and uh, thick, thick stuff. Um, I actually, I had a nice, a nice eight stand up at like probably 20 yards in front of me. And, um, and, and that was the, a doe only, never wasn't it? told me that. Yeah, when I was down at the bottom, I had a buck and a doe stand up. Really? And then I asked you if they walked up in front of you because you were positioned above me on the ridge and they walked that direction. I never saw but it was so thick. That's like, tricky. Even even the irons on the on the gun were not great past much beyond that. Um, yeah. yeah, I got the hammer back, but then I really wanted Jim to shoot a deer on that. And then I thought, God, if we shoot one down here, it is going to be a bugaboo to get it out. <laughs> Yeah, that and would have been a haul. It, it was would all have, uphill. It would have sucked. Um, we would have been cutting things apart, making multiple trips. Um, and uh, I did go back to that spot. I didn't bring my lever gun. Maybe I should have. Um, I didn't. But anyway, uh, yeah, it would probably be more of a, a nostalgic or, or um, just a fun hunt, if you right. will. Right. Will, I will say that I, I remember you guys were there when I got this gun. Mm-hmm. We were on the trip in wherever we were, and I was like, none of the guns that I own, they're all weird, first off. And and none of them would I be like, here you go, offspring. This <laughs> is a really cool rifle that your father owned. You know, Because if I gave them any one, they'd be like, what is this? <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. And so that's why I got this, because I was like, when you go on a hunt, I have actually lent this gun out before to, to uh, a couple of friends, I remember, and, and they shot deer with it. When I, you know, have shot deer with it, too. I mean, it's just, when you do it with a lever gun, it feels so, extra, different. There's an extra stamp there. It feels more special. And just, and I was like, all right, well, you know, if you get handed this from oh, yeah, that's a, something. a parent like, that's or something like nice. that, you're going to, this is so much more cool to me than to be like, here's just an average bolt action. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I agree. That's stories why we, that go along that's, with that's, it are there's certain there's definitely something to that. That's but. why we got the old uh, 1895s. I do often forget that I have the 1895. I forgot I had it for three years. I forgot we had it on order for three years. <laughs> for three years, that's right. Yeah, I, no, that's a fun one too. I'm gonna hopefully try to shoot a pronghorn with that or a mule deer with that coming up here pretty quick. Yeah, my brother and I inherited, I believe, some lever guns from uh, my grandfather that they're at my brother's house. And it's funny because, like, growing up, you know, like, we'd go and look at those guns. And I always thought they were, like, really neat, you know, and, like, my grandpa would show them to me and my brother and tell us, you know, some of the stories behind them and things like that and when he got them and why. And, and, uh, but, like, now more than ever. You want them. I want them, but, like, I don't remember everything about them. So, like, I'm really excited to, like, get with my brother, chat with him about them, what they are, you know, next time I go home, check them out. Maybe maybe grab one and go on a deer hunt, which it, I think would be really cool. Lever guns also have something about them where it seems as though every single one, especially old ones, there's something unique and special about it. Mm-hmm. I've I've almost never seen, and my litmus litmus test is oftentimes when when Ryan you're nearby when somebody produces an old lever gun. I've almost never seen one come out where it's like, oh yeah, that's one of the hundred thousand they made all just like that one. Yep. It's almost always, oh, yours has the weird front sight. Yours has a, a weird tube magazine, an interesting type of wood. Yours has an interesting intricate design on the receiver. Yours has an interesting lever. It's a big hoop model. It's a golden boy model. It has a weird rear sight. It has a weird stock. It's got something underneath the metal plate in the butt stock. There's always something about an old lever gun that's unique. Whereas if you produce, you know, kind of like, I mean, certainly if you produce an AR, it's kind of like, oh, you know, cool handguard, bro, <laughs> whatever, you know, or if you produce kind of an old other type of rifle, I mean, unless it's something genuinely super unique, you're more likely to get, you know, a bolt action rifle. You're like, oh yeah, that's how they made them yep. for 10 years. Yep. No, I agree. They're cool, man. Get one. Do get it. one of the new ones, not one of the old ones. <laughs> Just <send. laughs> Just send you that on us. over my way. I'll take. I'll get rid of that, that thing sounded, for you. That sounded pretty self-serving. You just Ryan. send that on over my way. I'll make sure that's taken care of. But uh, man, yeah, I'll. Uh, Anybody Ryan got creates any? his own Fast and Furious program just for lever actions. Yeah. We're collecting all the lever actions. Anybody's got a '64 <laughs> Deluxe and '25, '35 that's got a uh, vintage 
uh, like a marbles peep on it, and you want to separate yourself with it for a reasonable price, let me know. <laughs> I want to hunt pronghorn with a twenty-five thirty-five. That'd be cool. That would be something. That would be. Yeah. And I like you're the it. guy to do it. I think so. All these lever guns tell such great stories. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the it's just such a uh, rich history. And I know a lot of folks out there have lever guns mm. already that they, you know, may have in, inherited over time from their father, their grandfather. Um, truly curious what folks have out there. If it if it sits in the safe and you know you maybe look at it once a year and put it back if you're if you if you still use it, yep, uh, things like that, cool cartridges, cool guns, we like all those things. Let us know. Maybe something we need to talk about. I don't. Know. Should pull the lever on this one. Pull the letter lever, 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 the lever, hundred <laughs> percent lever. All right, thanks everybody for listening. Take care. We'll catch you on the next one. See ya. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.